And I did meet other podcasters who were like me, who were in their basement. They're like, I don't really know if I belong here. And I'm like, okay, good. Let's stick together. <laughs> Let's be friends. Let's go to the sessions that we want to go to. And I got a lot out of it, especially being a new podcaster, because I still had no idea all the things that I could possibly do with a podcast at that point. Podcast Junkies, episode 183. Welcome back. I'm your host, Harry Duran, coming to you live, although you're hearing it taped. Do people actually ta- say taped when it's podcast anymore? Anyways, coming to you time delayed from Los Angeles and recording this episode right before I head out to support my friend and previous guest of the show, Jay Connor host of Extraordinary Negroes. He's having a Podcasters of Color uh, event today in Los Angeles, tonight in Los Angeles. So I'm going to meet up with him and Annette Bone, previous guest as well. This is going to be there, I just confirmed. So that's awesome. And uh, Zach and Rock from Squadcast and a couple of other of my podcasting peeps. So I'll let you know how that event went in an upcoming episode or or next episode uh, when I record that. So if you missed last week, we had a great conversation with Mark Bologna, host of Beyond Bourbon Street. It was so nice to bring him back on, not bring him back on, to bring him on after knowing him because he had been at the Second Podcast Movement. And he talks a little bit about how he met me there and I gave him some advice for starting the show. He got connected with Lou Mangiello and with Michael O'Neill and Steve Stewart. And here we are three years later and now people are coming up to him for advice on how to start a show. So it's it's a really fun cycle journey when it comes to podcasting and it happens to a lot of us and I know it'll happen to you if it hasn't already. This week we speak to Emily Prokop. Emily, again, another we're another person where we're running in the same social podcasting circles and we got to finally uh, talk for uh, a bit longer at Joe Pardo, Super Joe Pardo's uh, MapCon event. And that was uh, a couple of months ago. And it's, it's great. It's, I think it's about 100 folks um, who are in attendance. And I've been twice already. And I just like to go because it's so small. <laughs> That's one of the main reasons. And so I said, Emily, uh, it's time to get you on. And she was telling me everything that's been happening to her. She talked a little bit about it at MapCon and she's just a super inspirational. In this specific episode, we talk about her educational background, what she decided uh, and made decisions about when it came to starting the story behind podcast. And we share what we love both about actual podcasting, about her first podcasting event and how she leveraged journalism to become successful. What she does, she's also published a book um, she talks about her first experiences meeting and networking with other podcasters. We talk about how to build an audience, one listener at a time, uh, and why she places an importance on researching, preparing for her podcasts. So it's very interesting because she's got an, a, a very fascinating podcast and uh, with a bunch of eclectic topics. And that was one of my questions as well, like how they come up with that. So all that and more is covered in this week's episode. And full show notes will be available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 183. As a lot of you may have heard on previous episodes, I have a mission of helping a million people find their voice. And I've been thinking about this mission for a long time. I go to a lot of conferences and I'm inspired by some of them and some of them are so-so. Um, but what was more interesting for me was the demographic of folks who attend these conferences And what I discovered uh, being Latino is that there were a lot of what I would consider underrepresented voices, both in the audience and on stage. And I've been thinking about that for some time now. And so thankfully, through a connection I had with uh, Chris Grimitzos and John Dennis of PodFest, I'm partnering with them to actually launch my first conference ever. It's going to be called Clarion. And it's at uh, clarionconference.com. The site just went up a couple of days ago. I'm incredibly excited. I'm incredibly nervous and uh, I'm incredibly honored to share this next leg of my journey with you guys. So it's if you are planning to attend PodFest and you have not bought your ticket, the ticket to Clarion will actually uh, get you into PodFest as well. So it's included one ticket price. You can attend Clarion, which is going to be on Wednesday, March uh, 6th, Wednesday, March 6th, the day before uh, PodFest kicks off. So this is something that's been a passion project for me. And now it all aligns when I think about this idea of helping people find their voice. I do it with Podcast Junkies. I do it with my company, Fullcast. And now I'm going to have the opportunity to to do it again and to bring together some very powerful speakers that we already have uh, lined up already. 
And there may be some faces there that you'll recognize as I'm talking to friends in the podcasting community, in my entrepreneurial circles, and who other powerful voices that I'm being connected to. So please check it out, clarionconference.com. And if you're listening through here, through this episode, just use promo code Harry sent me and you get $50 off your ticket as a fan of Podcast Junkies. So I'd love your feedback. Uh, let me know what you think of the, of the copy of the conference, clarionconference.com. Don't forget to hang out until the end of the episode where all the cool kids are. It's kind of like the bathroom in high school where the the rockers would go to smoke. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't a rocker and I didn't smoke in high school. So maybe that's a bad experience. But anyway, that's that's where you'll find the retention hashtag at the end of the episode. And it's your way of uh, sharing out some tweet love and uh, letting us know that you're part of that inner circle. So hang out till the end. But for now, enjoy this conversation with Emily. So Emily Prokop, host of The Story Behind, thank you for being a guest on Podcast Junkies. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is kind of a bucket list item for me. So super excited. <laughs> Seems like you've been checking off bucket list items recently. You actually just published a book. Yeah, I wasn't even expecting to add that to my bucket list. So <laughs> that was kind of surprising. It was something that I've always wanted to do, but I didn't think it would be something that I could actually do and sit down and write for an extended amount of time. So, and it was weird because I write for my podcast and I never thought to turn it into a book. Yeah. Never. So, well, a lot of podcasters, a lot of our mutual friends have done just that same thing because you realize after you have enough content built up over years and years, it's just natural that, you know, you, you can consolidate some of that into, in, a, in a more consumable form. I thought I was going to keep doing it with, um, the first one that I did, I published a small book called uh, Around the Podcast Campfire, and it was the first 25 conversations. And I was like, yeah, every 25, I'll just publish a new version of the book. <laughs> when you realize just how, just how much work it is, I worked with a pub, with an editor to put that together. I realized very quickly after I hit uh, episode 50 and was on my way to, to 100, how hard it was going to be to do it. So I just got that first one out the, for the first 25. But, you know, you need a lot of work to cull together something that um, originally sounds well in audio, but when you have to put it into written format, it's a, it's a whole different beast, right? Yeah. And I was kind of lucky in a way because I do write how I speak. I know that's not what you're supposed to do, but when I was trained, I was a journalism major in college and I was trained to write simply because when you're writing news stories, you want people to be able to understand it. So I kind of already had taken out a lot of flowery language in how I wrote. and because I was writing scripts for my show, I don't use a lot of flowery language anyway. I mean, it's kind of hard to do with history because everything is very cut and dry. You can't be like, oh, let me take a chapter and 50 pages to describe a door, you know, <laughs> like um, Hemingway does. You can't make history into Hemingway. So <laughs> I'm sure you can. I'm sure people are much better about that. So Dan Carlin, good job. <laughs> But uh, yeah, shout out to Dan Carl in Hardcore History. <laughs> yeah. uh, did you study literature as well? I did. I was an English major for a while and I got done with all the writing classes. And then for some reason, I don't know why I took writing classes first and I got them all out of the way because they were my favorite things to do. And then I had one semester where I had two literature classes and I walked into the bookstore, looked at my book list and I was just walking out with just stacks of literature. And I'm like, this is a mistake. First of all, I don't really like reading things that are assigned to me. I was very just a stubborn kid. Wikipedia wasn't around in high school. And if it were, all of my book reports would have been Wikipedia based. <laughs> we had Cliff's Notes. So that was good. I feel bad for teaching. I feel bad for teaching. I know. <laughs> I know. I, like, and I'm trying to teach my kids, you have to read this. You have. And meanwhile, I'm just like, don't worry. Like you can Google that when you're older. I promise you, you just have to do the work now. <laughs> <laughs> you ended up majoring in journalism then? Yeah. So once I got to the literature classes and realized, oh, this is not good. I think I trudged through them. I took in one semester, I took Greek and Roman literature. That was actually a really fun course. But at the same time, I was also taking medieval literature. And that was a terrible course. And I hated it because I didn't realize that Old English is very hard to read, even though it's still English. It's still very hard to read. And I had to take, um, it was like a prerequisite or one of those education classes that you had to take. It was part of your core education to, in college. And I had a choice between 
I think it was psychology, sociology, and journalism. And I ended up taking Journalism 101. And I just fell in love with it. It just made sense to me. I still got to write and I got to discover things. And that was one of the things that I really liked about writing was also learning things and then being able to take it and mold it into my own words and put it onto paper. And that's why journalism appealed to me so much. Not so much the talking to people. I was very introverted. And they were like, well, you have to go out and put microphones in people's faces. And I was like, no, I'll take journalism and learn how to write at my desk. And um, copy edit was my big thing. I was an editor for many years and pretty much what I fell into. So one of the things that we had to take in journalism was an audio class. And I was thinking, oh, I'm never going to use this. I'm never going to go into radio. Why am I taking this class? And then meanwhile, you know, when I finally started a podcast 10 years later, I open up Audacity for the first time and I'm like, I know how to use this. Oh, man. <laughs> so I'm wondering, um, because you started the show in 2016 and like what I, I'm always curious about what really like what was your first foray into podcasting? And and then there's a difference between listening and being a fan of and then deciding at some point that you wanted to take the leap yourself. Yeah, that was a wine decision. <laughs> was, Most I times have, is, yeah. Yeah, I had been listening to podcasts. I loved them so much because I, I always had long commutes because that's the thing. If you're a journalism major and you try to find a job, job in journalism, very rarely do you get a short commute because newspapers end up being so far away from where you are, where it's affordable to live. And during that time, I got sick of what was on my iPod. At one point, my iPod was stolen and I had a smartphone and I discovered podcasting actually right after I had, or not podcasting, but I discovered podcasts uh, when I was getting a divorce actually and I had moved into an apartment and I didn't have TV yet and I needed something to listen to. And I was very worried about, oh, if I put on music, a song will set me off. Like I'll get really upset and crying and I can't put on dance. Like I'm not in the mood for dance music either. And so the Purple app had just come out on the iPhone. And I was like, well, I've listened to NPR before. Like, let's see what this does. And I opened it up. I found my first podcast, which was Good Job Brain. I started playing it and I realized just that dark tunnel of just sorrow and feeling sorry for myself and not being able to see the light at the end of the tunnel started to go away because I was listening to four people talk about pub trivia. Like they weren't even helping me get over a divorce. They, they weren't setting out to do that. But just from listening to them and then binge listening to them, it was like, this is great. I can be a fly on the wall. My mind can be somewhere else. It could be off the thing that's really getting me down. I can unpack my stuff. And I found myself smiling and laughing for the first time in weeks, pretty much. And that's pretty much how I discovered it. And um, then a few years later, a few years passed, and I got into more podcasts because they're like tattoos. Once you start listening to one, you're like, well, what else is out there? Like potato chips. Or <laughs> and as I was listening to it, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, he's like, we have this equipment. You should start a podcast. And I'm like, no, I don't want to start. I have nothing to talk about. I don't really want to do this. And then finally, a friend of mine and I, we were drinking wine and I'm like, we're talking about trivia. He and I were always the ones who were like, oh, I just read this really interesting article about this. And we would tell each other and we get so excited to tell the other person. And then we'd sit there like, and that's it. Nobody else heard that amazing conversation. And then we had more wine and I said, we should start a podcast. And so at that point, I knew it was a wine idea. So I was like, all right, well, let's just hash it out. Let's not Google yet how to start a podcast. Let's just play with this idea for now. Exactly. Like, let's just play with this idea for the night. And then the next day, I woke up no longer under the influence of wine. And I thought, that's still a good idea. I'm going to do this. I'm going to Google how to start a podcast. And luckily, that same day, I remember Googling it at work and finding Podcasters Roundtable with Ray Ortega and Daniel J. Lewis and Dave Jackson. And thank God that was the 
the first thing that I found about how to start a podcast because I couldn't have gotten three better right off the bat mentors for podcasting than just, oh my gosh, and there are more videos and this is actually a podcast. What? There are podcasts about podcasting? Like I just, it blew my mind that that was out there. And then it really, it didn't really hit just how many podcasts there were until I think I saw the meta-ness of a podcast about podcasting. And I was like, there really is a podcast for everything. So that kind of got me into it. And I think, well, I started the equipment that my husband said he had were rock band mics. (laughs) And I joke about that. And I still tell people, I'm like, my first episodes of my first podcast, the classy little podcast are still out there. If you really want to look at three years, what three years of a difference will make when you think that rock band mics are good enough. Nobody will care. It's fine. (laughs) And so those are still up there. I can't listen to them, but if somebody else wanted to, they could. Well, that's the story with every new podcast. I mean, everyone knows that your first episode is the one that's definitely cringeworthy, but your 10 sounds better than your first, and and people just keep going at it, and your 50th sounds better, and you know, I'm I'm heading towards 200, and I just, I mean, I still, there's stuff that I still hear that I I, want to get better and better, but I think as podcasters, and as content creators, I think if we didn't always look to improve our craft, I think we wouldn't be the ones starting the show to begin with because we take pride in what we do. And I think that's what I really liked about podcasting because I was very much into print journalism and I was working at a publishing house at the time for puzzle books and technology didn't change. I was seeing all this stuff happening online, but we were still using DOS. In fact, the company that I was at is still today using DOS to help put together books and publish. And I'm like, and we were using um, AIM until AIM shut down. And I'm like, guys, there, there's this thing. It's called Slack. Oh, and it's it, amazing. It, you know? <laughs> well, it's the messenger. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And but there's something about working in corporate where it's very slow to change. And what I loved about podcasting was there was always something new to learn. And in a lot of print media, it, they're a little slower to catch on. Plus, you know, in a big company like that, you'd have to catch everybody on. Whereas in in podcasting, it's like, oh, okay, I get it. Let me tell my friends because they're all online and they're all ready to hop onto Skype and just learn this new thing. And I think that's what I really loved was there's always something new to learn with podcasting. And it's funny because I had never found a hobby before this that kept me entertained for more than three months. It was like, all right, I'll do this little podcasting hobby and most likely I'll drop it three months later and go on to something new. So it was really surprising that I had made it a year. And then when my first podcast ended, I had friends in the podcasting space. So they had already had sort of this connection with me that I didn't want to lose. I didn't want to stop podcasting. I was like, I wasn't ready to hop back in after the first one. But when it did, it was nice that I was able to text another podcaster and be like, hey, I have this idea for another podcast. What do you think? He's like, I don't care what it is. I want you behind the mic again. I want to hear your voice behind the mic. You need to get behind the mic again. (laughs) I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, what the feeling was like when you went to your first podcast related event. I don't know if it was maybe a local meetup or it actually was at one of the conferences, like what it felt like to be around a, a, a bunch of folks that were doing the same exact thing you were passionate about? It was funny. I won a ticket to Podcast Movement 2015, and I had been podcasting for maybe four weeks at that point. <laughs> and so when I got there, I was like, all right, I'm going to find other people like me. And apparently, because I've talked to other people who were there, so like, were you at the same conference as I did I, that I was at? And apparently, I just walked into the ones with all the the kind of sleazy entrepreneur types, and they were all like, "Hey, here's my business card sticking in my hand. My podcast is interviewing other business people about being awesome and and jacked up and hustling." And I'm just like, "Okay, well, my show is about wine and cheese and trivia." And somebody actually, as I was halfway through that sentence, turned put his business card in somebody else's hand and started his whole spiel again. He was like, oh, I want nothing to do with this podcast. And that was one of my first impressions. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is not for me. That I am in the wrong place. I am doing the wrong thing. And luckily, you know, I stuck it out. 
And I got to meet people that I had quickly latched on to as podcasting heroes. And when I met Daniel J. Lewis, and it, it's funny, I tell Dave Jackson this story. Like now we talk probably weekly. And at the time I rode an elevator with him and I was too afraid to talk to him. And I got in the elevator and I'm like, oh my God, it's Dave Jackson. Oh my God. Oh, I just can't. I just, I can't. And he left and I'm sitting there just almost reaching out like, I missed it. I missed my chance. <laughs> and it's so funny just yeah. to think back to that. <laughs> well, it's interesting knowing Dave and, and we've got the chance to hang out with him as well um, recently at, at MapCon. And he's such a down to earth guy that he, he totally would have been so friendly with you and ha- as he is with new podcasters or veteran podcasters. And I, I think know. he's one of the most down to earth podcasters. I know. And I have to remember that there were people like that at that conference, aside from this one terrible <laughs> card shark pretty much that I met. And and I did meet other podcasters who were like me, who were in their basement. They're like, I don't really know if I belong here. And I'm like, okay, good. Let's stick together. <laughs> Let's be friends. Let's go to the sessions that we want to go to. And I got a lot out of it, especially being a new podcaster, because I still had no idea all the things that I could possibly do with a podcast at that point. So it was cool to see all those different You could do this or you could do this. And then again, there was new technology at the time. Periscope was brand new and somebody was talking about it in a session. And halfway through a session, he's like, guys, I know this is about Periscope, but this new thing called Blab just came out and this is going to be the big thing. And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh my God, I'm on the leading edge of technology. Like, I love this. I love learning this new tool that I can use. And that's, I think, one of the big things for podcasters when they're starting out is just because all these new tools, they're shiny and you can use them and they're free. You don't have to. And I think (laughs) that's what overwhelms me sometimes. I'm like, oh, there's something new. I want to try it. Oh, yay. And I kind of have to calm down, come back to earth. But I think for the first conference, I would have rather probably gone to something like MapCon or DC PodFest Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. but I did get such a high from podcast movement. And I think that's also probably what kept me going was the fact that this is big. This is a really big deal. This was so cool. I got to meet Sarah Koenig and I mean, the journalist yeah. part of me was like geeked out a lot. And I remember having her sign my podcast movement book too. I was like, can you sign this for me? I still have it. And I'm like, what am I going to do with this? I don't know, but I don't know. I'm okay. Geeking <sighs> that's out. That's hilarious. I have- I always wonder what people do with all these signatures that they that they collect, and especially like in the sports world, these people that collect these baseballs with all the baseball players <laughs> yeah. and people who, who stand outside of like Broadway shows and get all these playbills signed. And it seems interesting when you first get it, but then like years later, you're cleaning out your house and you're just like, what am I going to do with all this stuff? I know. I know my mom's giving me her old signatures on things and she's like... Oh, here's Betty Davis. And I'm like, Mom, this is like a napkin that Betty Davis signed. You can barely even read it. That's really cool. I can tell people that. But it's still a dirty napkin. <laughs> so t- t- talk a little bit about, um, you know, your your the expertise you brought in having majored in journalism and how you decided with the second show to approach it a little bit differently. Because if I heard you correctly, you you actually script out your episodes. Yeah, that was one of the the cool things with journalism is the amount of research that you learn to do. Like you learn kind of how to cull Google for sources that are legitimate and sources that are bogus. So we love we love folks that make a guest appearance on podcast junkies because that's just it's especially because it's a show about podcasting. So it's the reality of what happens when you podcast. So it is a lot of a lot of my bloopers are me yelling at the cat so because she's obsessed with my desk. As soon as I'm talking on it, (laughs) what's her name? Princess. His or her name? Princess. Princess. Yeah, it's short for Princess Penelope Von Purry Pants. (laughs) (laughs) I'm that kind of a cat lady, but um, yeah, so. Having the journalism background and being able to cull through and pulling from sites like news sources, being able to use LexisNexis, being able to use things like the History Channel, the Discovery Channel, not like 
hey, Bob's awesome history blog at blogspot.com. And you can kind of tell by the writing that this guy's just throwing out conspiracy theories as fact. And it's like, all right, yeah, I'm not going to throw that in there. Maybe if it's entertaining enough, I'll say, oh, and by the way, some people believe that, you know, this is a thing. And one of the things I do on my show is I make sure to have my sources in my show notes. And I refer to them at the end and say information from this episode was sourced from this because I'm not a trained historian at all. And I've talked to Liz Covart before about this, uh, who hosts Ben Franklin's World. And I mean, she is the historian. And I've talked to her and I'm like, you know, I feel weird being in the history category. And she's like, no, you do a great job. Don't worry about it. Just getting that reassurance from her. (laughs) She's like, it's fine that you're not a historian. You're citing your sources. You're fine. Don't worry. <laughs> what was it? Why was that important to you? I'm, I'm curious because um, it seemed that you go above and beyond what someone, what most people would do. And, and you did cite Liz and she was episode 43, Podcast Junkies. I spoke to her early on and now she's like getting millions of downloads on her show. And it's so nice to see like the trajectory. Um, but it's nice that you had an opportunity to speak with with her I'm wondering if you also had a chance to speak to Jonathan Oakes, who's also been on the show, because you, you mentioned this, you know, this this passion with trivia. Yeah, yeah. When I I finally ran into him at this past podcast movement, and I remember at the first podcast movement, he had just started his show too, and I remember being like, I think we met in passing quickly, and I was like, I need to keep him on my radar because we're doing roughly the same thing, and now you look how he's grown, and it's just amazing to see from year one to year three and then kind of having him it's crazy yeah but kind of having him as like someone who knows who i am and i know who he is so it's like someone on twitter maybe is looking for a history or a trivia podcast it's like oh you know what i'm gonna say liz kovart and jonathan oaks because i know them i like them i trust them their shows are great i'm gonna happily recommend them to people so i mean there's another pro for going to conferences is I've met those people in real life and I have that connection with them. And that's also to say that when you listen to a podcast, you get that connection with somebody. So when I met Jonathan in real life, I was like, I already know you, but I don't because we've never had a real conversation, but I've heard your voice for so long. And Jonathan was 107. So it's so, so interesting because, you know, when we get started, where you, there's a little bit of imposter syndrome because there's so many people doing so many great things in the space and we're like, oh, I don't ever know. How do I ever get, you know, think about me getting to episode 50 or getting to episode 100? But then you realize how accommodating and how friendly and how helpful this community is. And, and you, you know, you start to see it as you go to more conferences year after year. This was number five for podcast movement. I've been to all of them. And, you know, they sort of become your family and you become like, there's these waves. There's like this earlier wave of like the, the godfathers of podcasting and then there's like this next wave that came up like the cliff ravenscrafts the amy porterfields the pat flynn's and then there's like this other wave of people who just started like you know between 14 2014 2016 and we just kind of all are friends with each other we watch each other's show grow and and there's going to be another wave of, of podcasters who are just you know just now getting started you know between 16 and 18 and and i think um it's just we all feel like this sense that the, the, a rising tide is lifting all, all the boats. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think having that group that you kind of all feel like you're on the same level, there's always going to be somebody who's a little bit above you. And it's really nice to be able to meet that person because you're watching them grow kind of at the same pace you are, but you already know what that next step or this the next step after that is going to be. So you're prepared for it. Because I remember Jim Collison saying, when you get into a certain number of downloads, that's going to be your sweet spot. And as soon as he said that, I forget the number. I want to say it's maybe under 10,000 is the sweet spot. And when he says that, I'm like, that is. Because I can't imagine having more than that. It, it's already weird when people who I've never met write me these long emails and they started off, they started off and I never quite know where to go with the sentence with, I love your voice. And I'm like, all right, where is this going? Because this could go in many different directions because I've gotten those emails. I don't it's like true. them. But- That's funny. That's funny. 
But then they get into, oh, and you talked about this and they want to tell me their stories. And I love that. I just, I want to be able to read all those and respond to those. And it always scares, I don't know, it's a weird thing to say. It's almost egotistical, but it almost scares me that one time, one day I might not have the time to really read that and respond to Mm. everything I want to respond to. And that, that thought scares me a lot. So I understand what he's talking about with the sweet spot. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, I still make it a point um, because, every, I mean, podcasting is all I do now. I mean, I have the show. I've been doing it for four plus years. My business, we produce shows for other clients. And so I eat, sleep and breathe podcasting. But there's something really important about maintaining that connection with your listeners and um, with all this noise going on about gaming the system and using folks on Fiverr to get into the top downloads. There's no like shortcut to success. And I always tell people the way you get a listener is one at a time. and and for me, it's a bit meta because I go to podcasting conferences to meet other podcasters. But, you know, <laughs> you have to find a place where you can gather to find where your listeners are um, to let them know about your show. And and it's, you know, there's no one size fits all in terms of strategy. But I think if you're consistently producing quality content, people are going to find you. And, you know, you just have to make it a point to engage with them to the extent you can answer the email, answer the tweet, yep. reply on Facebook. You know, it, it's really important. Yeah. And doing that as well, being able to do that slowly one person at a time is so much easier than all of a sudden having 10, 20,000 people discover your show and opening up your email inbox one day to just all a barrage of emails. Being able to do that one at a time. I don't know about you, but if I walk into a party and I don't know anybody, I have to meet them one at a time and I have to seriously look at them for five minutes and say, your name is John. Your name is John. Your name is John. You're wearing a blue tie. If I meet you again, you can never change your tie because this is the tie I remember you in. Like, I'm really bad at remembering people unless I meet them one at a time. <laughs> or if someone's like, hey, there's John and Bob and Dave and Susie. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to remember any of your names. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's like, psh, yeah, mind yeah. overload. Yeah. One of those, one of the tricks I've, I've used in the past is if you get the name, you try to envision a famous celebrity with that name and then that celebrity wearing a piece of clothing or an earring or the hat that the, the person you just met is wearing and you kind of just like put those two together And because I need the visual because I've literally met people, I've turned around yeah. and I've turned back and I'm like, oh no, I just forgot your name. <laughs> I have to do that. If I'm talking to somebody and I'm making small talk, it's it, it, when I first meet them, I'm like, oh yeah, so great weather we're having. I'm not listening. I'm repeating their name over and over again in my head that I'm just... <laughs> I can't. I'm really, really bad with it. And that that's really a nice thing about podcasting and having that online space too is to get to know people's profile pictures. If one of my friends changed their profile picture, it would take me a while to be like, oh, who are you? Oh, no. Oh, dear. <laughs> you know, I was wondering why, if you could just kind of elaborate a little bit, why it was important for you, maybe as a journalism, journalism major, to decide you wanted to put that amount of prep work into each one of your shows? What's funny was when I first put the prep work in, I could do a lot of it in my lunch hour. But the thing is, with research and finding out new information for me, I get sucked into these rabbit holes. And then then it's time to write the script about it. So a lot of it is, I like doing that amount of research and I like putting stuff out there that Maybe I didn't know, which means my audience might not have known it. So the episode that's coming out this week, I just did the printing press. And everyone has learned, oh, Gutenberg invented that in Germany. And it seems like such almost a boring topic. I wasn't necessarily going to do it. I'm like, well, everyone's already learned about this. And then I found out all these details. Like, actually, the only reason we know about Gutenberg is because he was sued so many times that that's the only record we have of him are lawsuits against him and financial records. And I'm like, oh, well, that's really interesting. Or I did the teddy bear a few weeks ago, the story behind the teddy bear. And I found out that the story I thought I knew about Teddy Roosevelt and the bear there are maybe three different versions of that story. And I love throwing them all in there so that people get that well-rounded, researched story behind the things. So for somebody starting out, if they're worried about, oh, well, I don't want to do that much research, there are podcasts out there where they will gladly admit they read Wikipedia verbatim. And that's kind of their 
their thing that they do, which is fine. But what you want to do for your podcast is you want to put something out there that maybe people haven't heard before. Maybe they can't just do a few clicks on Google to get to. So that's kind of where I came at it with all the research. And I also wanted to sound like I knew what I was talking about (laughs) because when you do a podcast, you end up getting this professional, I guess you get kind of, you're an authority in a way, even though I'm not any sort of, again, I'm not a historian. I'm not like a history authority, but just doing a podcast and getting behind a microphone and pressing publish kind of makes you an authority in a weird way. So you kind of want to show that you're worth being looked at as an authority. So I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, definitely, because it's important. And I think like listeners shouldn't be deceived by the duration of your show because it's, each one is about five to ten minutes. But I mean, how much time would you say you put into the prep of each episode? It's really funny. It takes about three or four hours of research. Uh, three or four hours to research and write the episode. And I remember the first few episodes I did, I wrote out five ahead of time before even pressing record just to make sure they I liked the flow of everything. And finally, I pressed record on the first one. And I was figuring, okay, this is about three or four pages in Google Docs. This should be about 15 to 20 minutes. I stopped the recording. I edited it. And it got to eight. I'm like, eight? Eight minutes? I put four hours of work into this, the eight minutes, no one's going to listen to this. And I was like, you know what, though? I think it's interesting. I'll put them out. And at the time for the first year, I was putting them out twice a week because I was like, eight minutes isn't long enough. I feel bad. I'm just going to put out twice a week instead and double up on the, the number of episodes. And so I did that. But then I was hearing from people and they were saying, you know, your show is great for when I have to run to the grocery store or when I have to walk the dog. It's short like that. And a lot of people were saying, you're putting them out too often that it's nice for when I have to binge listen to something. But really, I like having a short podcast. I like that it's a little tiny snippet that I could run to whenever I need to. And I have heard from people that they save them up and they binge listen to them, which is great. And I always can tell when I get a new subscriber because I get a nice spike and I look and I see like, oh, episode 100, one download, episode 99, one download, episode 98, one download. <laughs> and I can tell when somebody just found it and they're binging it. And it's it's a really nice feeling. So even though it's short, it's nice. And I've, I haven't gotten, I have gotten people who ask for it to be longer. And I tell them, I'm like, well, it's longer. There's going to probably be a bigger wait time. And now at this point, because like you now I'm like, 24 7 in podcasting because now I do editing and consulting and stuff. It's like I'm <laughs> I'm so just busy trying to run a business that unfortunately sometimes my podcast takes the back burner because it's like, but this is my thing. So uh, yeah. you know, and it's hard. It's really hard to do that. I don't know. And especially because it's so short and I feel bad when people are like, where's your episode? It's only eight minutes. Why can't you do it? It's like, well, th- there's a lot of stuff that goes into those eight minutes, unfortunately. I hate to tell you. I mean, that's why, again, Dan Carlin, like, that's why you got to wait months and months and months for his basically audiobook length <laughs> podcast. Yeah. Yeah. It's like if you only knew. And I think it's almost like they're so short, but, and there's, it's, it's like this, it's just like a nutrient dense, like protein bar, like it's like they're tiny sometimes, but they've got like so much packed in there that they're, they're just like, you could, there's, each, if you, if you probably break down each minute, you know, when you think about how much information you're providing, um, I think the true fans of the show have come to appreciate how much information you're packing into a short period of time. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's again, the journalism trying to fit things into, you know, when you have a lot of information and then your editor says to you, Hey, we only have eight inches to fit the story at eight inches on a newspaper column. And you're like, well, uh, this story is a 30 inch story and you really have to pick and choose exactly how to condense all of that. And I mean, there goes the flowery language and trying to make things sound prettier and trying to add all the extra things to it. Cause I would love to be able to research and put every single thing 
that I've learned into the episode. But for me, I have to take it, kind of compact it. And I mean, I have to do the same thing with my brain because I'm ADHD. So it's like, okay, I cannot deal. This is a lot of information. Let me pack it all tiny so I can remember it and spit it out onto paper and then read it. And it's funny because sometimes it's like when I was in school and I would have a test and you know, you'd study and you'd cram and then you take that test and then the next day you could forget all that stuff. And that's kind of how I am with my episodes. Someone will be like, oh, hey, remember that inventor you talked about when you did the story behind Sugar Skulls, which was two years ago at this point? And I'm like, no, I no, I'm going to have to look back at that episode because it's gone now. It's absolutely gone. I made room for episode 120 that I just did, you know, a week, two weeks ago. <laughs> I'm really curious because um, for folks who are new to the show, and I'm, I'm sure you hopefully get a whole bunch of brand new listeners as a result of this episode, but I mean, you're literally all over the map and you mentioned Sugar Skulls. We're looking at Peanut Butter, Comic Sans Font, uh, Madame Tussaud, Cabbage Patch Kids, Potato Chips, Betty White, yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Pepper, Ping Pong, uh, Lucky Animals, Mechanical Keyboards, uh, yeah. Surfing, The Mustache. Uh, <laughs> the Knife, Las Vegas, Kit Kat, Slice Bread, The Band-Aid, The Paralympics, <laughs> Mer- Mercury Retrograde, S'mores. And that's just me picking and choosing. But I'm just wondering, is it just like, you know, do you just wake up one day or do you, do you have dreams about this stuff? I hope I don't have dreams about this stuff. But <laughs> a lot of it is if I don't have a topic, I will look on a calendar and say, OK, what is one of those weird national holidays that's coming up. So the story behind the teddy bear was because my episodes release on Thursdays and I knew that that Saturday was National Teddy Bear Day. So in my head, I'm already thinking, well, that's interesting. Let me just Google quickly what, what the history is of the teddy bear. And I found out that it was interesting and it interests me and I wanted to do more research on it. And I was like, okay, great. So I have this episode ready and I know I can use that hashtag to promote the show. So some of those... If you look at the dates, you can tell where it lines up. So Betty White, that was around Betty White's birthday. The nice thing is I can always reference those episodes when it's her birthday again. The Kit Kat peanut butter cup. Oh, I forget what else I did. But for the weeks leading up to Halloween last year, I did a bunch of Halloween candy. And then um, some things I've done series on. So uh, when you mentioned Knife, that was part of my Clue series. So I did six episodes based on the weapons from the movie Clue or the game in the movie Clue. I did the knife, the revolver, the rope, the lead pipe. Let's see if I can remember them all. (laughs) But I did those weapons. And then I talked about the movie. And then I talked about the game. And... I I know my audience really loves series. I wish that I had more time now that I could devote to them because they really liked it. So you talked about Lucky Animals. That was during March, my first year I was doing it. And I did a bunch of luck and superstitions. So that was a fun series. And then the other series I did, I did Forrest Gump February. My first February, I was doing it. So everything was a reference to the movie Forrest Gump. So in Forrest Gump, they talk about Dr. Pepper. I did the story behind that. I did uh, the story behind the schoolhouse door, which was referenced in Forrest Gump. And it was it was a really, it, it's really fun to just have those ideas. I'll have the idea for the series. And then I remember watching the movie and being like, oh, Dr. Pepper, ping pong. Oh, and I mean, just it, I'll just do a quick Google search as soon as I think of something and be like, well, is this interesting enough to talk about as a history? Because sometimes you'll look something up and be like, well, what's the history behind it? Oh, white guy invents it, makes a lot of money, the end. And I almost thought that was going to be the printing press <laughs> until I dug, <laughs> dug in a little bit deeper. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. All right. I'm intrigued. This is piquing my interest. And I I just hope that with my podcast, it's like you're making your podcast for thousands of other versions of yourself who also find this weird niche thing interesting. Yeah. So, and that's always what I picture. So the people who write to me, they're like, oh, I really like this. And I write back. I'm like, yeah, me too. Did you geek out as much as I did? So <laughs> They're out there. The, the meta question is uh, on June um 28th you published the story behind the book update number one so what i want to know is what what the story is behind the story behind uh genesis for like putting it into book format 
That was interesting. I was not expecting to make it into a book when I started, even though it makes perfect sense now that it would make a good book. (laughs) But at the time, I had just finished doing the story behind the musical, which was episode 100, which really, really did well. And I actually, I sang the whole thing and I was getting a lot of attention for that. And it was, it was cool. I was getting emails from people I'd never heard of. And then I got this email one day and it was um, an acquisitions editor named Brenda who worked at Mango Publishing. And she's like, Hey, I've listened to your podcast this sounds amazing. This sounds like something that could be turned into a book. Give me a call. And so I'm showing it to people. I'm like, is this real? Because, you know, as podcasters, if you have your email address out there, you get a lot of spam. <laughs> like your your email address is out. You're going to get spam and people being like, oh, you know, your web copy could use some work. It's like, no, no, no. So I'm showing it to people and they're like, no, that that looks legit. Like, why don't you write her back? And I'm like, mm, I don't know about this. So <laughs> I wrote her back. And she's like, okay, yeah, your show would be great as little chapters in a book. We could put a bunch together. How about you hop on a call? And I talked to her and she explained the structure of how the publishing company works and the steps I would need to take. And it wasn't like, and you know, my first question is, I'm like, all right, will this cost me anything? Because that's how you know that's a scam is when like a publishing company is like, oh, give us money. And she's like, no, why would you think that? I'm like, oh, I'm just making sure because I don't know. <laughs> and she was like, no, here's the process. Here's the contract. You know, take as much time as you want. Look through it. And my husband and I looked through it. And I was lucky at the time I was helping. Um, I still am. I still help uh, Steve Stewart with a show called uh, The Book Marketing Show. So I actually knew a bit of... Uh, a bit of behind the scenes of book marketing. And I was like, okay, this actually helps out being able to look over this contract and see that they're not buying the rights to my show. They're not buying the rights to the book. Like I can kind of take all of the rights are in my name. And that's something that's so important to me as soon as somebody reaches out to me. Like I've been reached out to by networks and I'm like, do I have to give up my rights? Do I have to give up my RSS feed? Yeah, no, that's it's not that's not a thing. No, <laughs> we're not doing that. As soon as every I signed the papers and then I put it off for many months, unfortunately, because it was really hard to start because I didn't know the format I wanted to use. And then finally, one day I sat down, I used an old episode and I reformatted it and um, turned it into chapters. And it was much easier than I thought it would be. But one of the things with the book that I really wanted to do was I didn't want it to all be past episodes because who's going to be buying the book? The people who already listened to the episode. Like what what do they need the transcripts for? If they asked me, if somebody emailed me and said, hey, could I have the transcript to the show? I'd be like, yeah, sure. Here you go. You know. <laughs> so what I did with the book I have, there are 50 chapters total. 20 of them are brand new that are not made into a podcast. They're not based on a podcast. I probably won't turn them into a podcast. I know. Yet, that's the thing. There's going to be a time when I come up against the line, a deadline, and I'm like, oh my God, I have nothing. Oh wait, I have a book. I can just grab one of those. But no, I really wanted to keep them just for the book, just for readers only. And then also bring readers into the podcast, people who had just picked up the book and didn't realize it was a podcast too. So. I wanted to make sure to do that. So that's kind of the story behind the book. There's going to be a book update too that is coming out this week because it's coming out on Monday. <laughs> Congratulations. How Thanks. was the, um, how would you describe the overall experience? I've heard people compare writing a book to having a baby and it absolutely is. It's about nine months <laughs> and you're forming this book and you're putting together all these pieces and you have no idea what it's going to look like when it comes out. You're just hoping for the best. And you're trying to give your body nutrients and do everything you're supposed to be doing. And for writing the book, you're you're writing what you're supposed to be writing. And you're making sure you're hitting those word counts. And you're making sure it's clean and pretty. And then you kind of send it off to the publisher. And you hope for the best. And you're like, okay, and now you have my baby. Please bring it back to me. Beautiful. And, you know, don't, don't change anything that's going to be a big deal for me. 
And then you get it. Like I got my advanced copies and it's it's still not real. It's still something that needs to sink in. It needs a few weeks to set in, which again is like having a baby. It's like this thing is real. Like I I have to care about this thing now. And even even the marketing for it, which is funny because a lot of marketing for a book is very similar to what people are already doing for their podcast. It's like, hey, remind people what's in the book. Show them the cover. Yeah. Give them snippets. Talk about it. <laughs> Don't keep selling to them. Make sure you're talking about yourself as well. And you're talking about all the cool things that they can learn from it. It's like, oh, this is just like marketing a podcast. Okay. All right. Very cool. Um, well, congrats again. I think um, it's I think it's interesting because as podcasters, I think there's always different ways you can repurpose content, and this is, this is a great way. And I think it's going to be an inspiration to a lot of podcasters, especially when they have, they have content that's formatted in the way you have it. And I think what's going to be what you're going to find is you're going to probably you know you're going to have a whole new audience that don't even know about the podcast that are discovering the book, and they're like, wait, this came from a podcast. I got to subscribe to the podcast. So that's going to be a nice crossover. Yeah, I think one of the coolest things was on the cover under my name, it says producer, the story behind podcast, which is like, all right, there it is. People know that this isn't just who's Emily Prokop. We have no idea who she is. She's just a trivia nerd. Like, what? what is that? But right on the cover, it says, hey, this person is from a podcast. So hopefully people will pick it up and be like, oh, well, I might not want to buy the book, but hey, maybe I'll listen to the podcast for a while. So hopefully, fingers crossed. It'll be a good thing. A uh, couple of questions as as we uh, round out the show. What's something you've changed your mind about recently? Well, <laughs> this is weird. I've gotten back into Pokemon Go, weirdly enough, and I have been losing weight. I do another podcast with John Buchanan's, uh called Hate to Wait, and we're going through our weight loss struggles and kind of our journey into weight loss. And it surprised me how much walking actually did affect my mindset about weight loss and the number on the scale. And I wasn't expecting that. I really thought it's just food only. Anytime I exercise just makes me more hungry. And uh, mm -hmm. so getting back into that, I ended up changing my mind because when I looked at the scale after a week of playing Pokemon Go and walking around again and getting outside, I was like, oh, it does affect my weight. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is a good thing. That is a good thing. Um, what's the most misunderstood thing about you? People see me online and they see the exclamation points and the emojis and the smiley face and they'll see me on video and I'm very peppy and outgoing. I'm that way when I'm talking about podcasting and when I'm talking to other podcasters. But if I'm by myself, I'm not. And I almost need like I need to step away and I need to stare at a wall for a while to kind of regroup and it, I mean, even going to a conference and I'm around a bunch of podcasters, I love it, but it drains me and not in a bad way, but it drains me yeah. to the point where I'm like, I just need to sit alone in quiet by myself, staring at a wall. And I think that surprises people. And they're like, you, you're an extrovert. I'm like, no, I am a major introvert. My energy comes from alone time. Just give me like three hours alone. And I will be more revived than if you gave me 12 hours of sleep. <laughs> it, you know, it's interesting, Emily, because a lot of um, it's been a consistent thread. I mean, I've asked that question and, and regular listeners will know that uh, the way it's described sometimes is situational uh, extrovert. Um, and I'm just I think we all we, we all love each other. And so when we all see each other at podcasting conferences. We're all uh, hanging out and having a good time. But I think um, to a person, I think that we all appreciate the fact that we get to do or, or we get to have some time where we can you know have the downtime and, and, and recharge and so that when we're back with our friends you know we're, we're, we are our usual peppy selves but um i definitely can relate to that and and sometimes it could be hours like you said or sometimes it could be even a couple of days or weeks when i'm, I'm not traveling anywhere we're just i'm sort of a hermit or a homebody um and i just feel that's it's a good thing to have that balance up and down yeah and i think it's also funny to find people who I love talking to as podcasters, but also knowing that, you know what, these would be the type of friends that could come over, sit on my couch, and we could just sit quietly for hours on our phones. And I mean, those are the best friends yeah. to have. It doesn't sound like that to people who are like, well, what is she talking about? That doesn't sound social at all. But in a way, it is. It, in a very weird way, it is. <laughs> 
No, I think it's, it just comes to like enjoying each other's company. And as we develop these friendships over the course of many years within our podcast community, we can probably identify folks like that, that we realize we have a, a kinship with because, you know, this, this, this unique bond that forms um, when we see each other and when and we see each other's shows. And it's just this like, nice camaraderie because we're all rooting for each other. We all, we all want each other to succeed. Yeah. And even when you listen to shows, you're kind of a fly on the wall. And I think one of the nice things for me as an introvert is there's no obligation for me to contribute to that conversation, but I can still be entertained by it, which is what I would do at par- at parties. And people would say, oh, she's so quiet and shy. No, I'm actually really enjoying this conversation. And I don't necessarily want to contribute anything to it because I like hearing the dynamic of you two talking. <laughs> So, I I mean, it's a huge deal when people are like, oh, so tell me something about yourself. I'm like, no, no, no. We're talking about you two. Go ahead. Keep going. Go ahead. (laughs) Yeah, it's a dynamic. Some people that are extroverts and and it's probably fewer than most people think because I think most people are a mix. But I think the people that are pure extroverts, that small percentage, I think I think um, they usually don't understand because I think they always are looking to be the center of attention and, and they can, you know, command a presence at, a, at, a, at an event or at a party. And it must get exhausting though. I, I don't know how they can sustain it. And that's how they, that's where they get their energy from. <laughs> if they're alone, they feel their energy draining, but it's funny. Somebody went on Dave Jackson's show and it was one of the best quotes I ever heard. And they were talking about being an introvert and podcasting. And they were like, you know, podcasting is a lot like an introvert playing an extrovert game. And that's exactly what it is. It really is. Because when you record your podcast, you're most likely, if you're doing a solo show, you're by yourself on a microphone. If you're doing it with somebody else, you're probably doing it with somebody who's very familiar to you, who people who are introverts, they know that you have a, a tight circle and you're comfortable talking with certain people. It takes a while to warm up to them but you get comfortable. And especially if you've already heard them on a podcast, you're already comfortable with them Mm because you're like, I know their quirks. I know how they talk. But I think that was the best way to describe it was an introvert playing an extrovert's game. (laughs) That sounds about right. Well, I appreciate uh, uh, us making this work. I'm glad we got to reconnect at MapCon. And uh, there's so many uh, friends of mine that I still have yet to get on the show. So I'm glad we were able... uh, It is late here. So for the benefit of the listener, we are at close to 11 p.m. on the East Coast time. But just goes to show you when uh, what what lengths podcasters will go through just to get an episode out, especially if it's important. And so I appreciate <laughs> you coming on and and, sh- and sharing your story with my audience. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast. So where's the best place for folks to track you down? So you can find everything at the storybehindpodcast.com. I'm on most social, well, the big three, the Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as at storybehindpod. And you can email me at the story behind pod at gmail.com. Oh, they can pick up the book at Amazon or Barnes and Noble or uh, Target.com. That was the weirdest thing was seeing my book on Target. I'm like, oh, Target, I go there all the time. That's my mothership and my book is there. Like, I was so happy to see it. That's awesome. <laughs> or they could go to Story the story behind book.com. You can go there too, and that'll bring you to links. Thanks again. I appreciate you coming on. Oh, thank you so much, Harry. So thanks again to Emily for coming on the show. Always appreciate it. I'm glad I'm able to make these connections and close these open loops that that feel like they've been going on for years with some of my podcasting friends. And I love sharing their stories with you. Full show notes available at podcastjunkies.com forward slash 183. Intro and outro music composed by Cedar and Soil. Don't forget to check out clarionconference.com. It's Clarion, my first ever live event. It's going to be more on the motivational, inspirational side. And I'm really passionate about this idea of helping people find their voice. So if you have a voice inside of you that needs to get heard, if you want to be inspired by people who have found their voice and have shown you what they can do and the types of businesses they can build, and the types of of lives they can lead and be around like-minded peers, then please check out clarionconference.com. Tune in next week for my conversation with Paul Adams. I know that uh, if you're paying attention closely, that was the episode we teased out last week as well. And so we had a little switch with our scheduling. So we're going to have that next week. Paul Adams, host of Sound Financial Bites. If you made it this far, then you are one of the awesome cool kids. The retention hashtag for this episode is hashtag Emily Story. 
E-M-I-L-Y, story, S-T-O-R-Y, and tag Emily at story behind pod. That's her Twitter handle and podcast underscore junkies. Thanks again for all you do to support the show. I love you guys and I'll catch you next episode.